For several months now, we have been talking about the central problem of everyone's personal life. And it's the problem of moral impotence. It's uh, most clearly capsulated probably in that verse, Romans 7 and 15, if you would like to look at it, because that's where we'll, we'll spend our half hour anyway in that chapter, Romans 7 and 15. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Dostoevsky called it that streak of moral perversity in mankind. Some others have called it the Mr. Hyde underneath our respectable religious Dr. Jekyll. But we all know fine well what it is. It's that thing inside us that makes us do what we know we shouldn't do. And drives us to distraction, really. To defeat and to despair. What we have been discovering over the past months is that most of us deal with the problem on far too narrow, really, far too narrow in a sense, and yet in a way far too broad a base. Far too narrow in the sense that we think the problem is much smaller than it really is. Far too broad a base in that, in a way, we're far too general about our attempts at a solution. That is, most of us think what we ought to do is try to deal with each of our moral failings one by one piecemeal. So we ought to take the irritability and concentrate on it for a while. We ought to take the uncleanness and concentrate on it for a while. And what we have all found is, of course, that the moment we begin concentrating on some other attitude than the one we were on, the miserable old dragon that we were trying to suppress before raises its ugly head and we're back where we started. So we found that when we try to deal with these moral failings, piecemeal, one by one, we discover that there's something deeper underneath them that we need to deal with, that keeps them coming up almost like the hydra's head, you remember. That monster that was met, to, oh, in that, that classical myth, where he would cut off one head and two would grow in its place. Cut off those two heads and four would grow in its place. Cut off those four heads and eight would grow. And so it went on. Every time you try to, you manage to slice away the impatience or slice away the bad temper, more things seem to come up in your life than were there before. And most of us are fine we've been making that mistake. So we've given up self-denial for Lent, and we've tried to practice generosity at Christmas time, and then when those seasons were over, we found we were as mean and as miserly as we ever were before, and that we were as undisciplined as we always used to be. And so that piecemeal approach we have found is really not satisfactory. And what we have seen is that God, our Creator, through Paul, the Apostle, has shown us that the problem is much broader than that. That the problem is not the individual failings. The problem is inside us ourselves. Our whole personalities have been turned back to front. That's really what Paul has been telling us that our whole personalities have been reversed. We were meant to operate in one way, and in fact we for years have been operating the other, and therefore we cannot possibly live the kind of life that the Creator has made us to live. A bit like running a car on uh, methane gas when it hasn't been adjusted to methane gas. You're never going to get the performance out of it that you'd get out of premium gas. It's a little like that. Uh, it's a little like a car made to operate on the internal combustion engine and you get two old horses and tie them to the front of it. You're never going to get much more than maybe four miles an hour out of it. It's operating just the wrong way. 
Now, it's the same with our personalities. The reasons that we have these defeats are to be found in the fact that our whole personality has been reversed. And we've been turned round back to front. And that's what needs to be turned round the right way. And in fact, we do what we do because we are what we are. That's what Paul says. says it there in Romans 7 and 14, the verse before, if you like to look at it. We know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. What we've been seeing is that we lose our temper, we have trouble with unclean thoughts, we have trouble with self-glorying mode of life, because we are carnal. And carnal means our personality has been turned round the wrong way. It's been reversed. The whole operation of our personality is back to front. You can see that in regard to the will. If you would just be patient with me, those of you who do come Sunday by Sunday, because there are dear ones who are here for the first time, and I really think we should love them enough to help them to see what we're discussing. Uh, you remember that uh, explicitly in First Thessalonians 5 and 23, God outlines the personality to us. May the God of peace himself sanctify you holy and keep your spirit, soul and body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And so we have seen really that there is a spirit, soul and body level in our personalities. Not that they are necessarily uh, entities that can be philosophically defined, but we do know that we exist at three different levels of our personality. And implicitly in the rest of the Old Testament, God has outlined to us the parts of the Spirit, that we have an ability to commune with Him, an ability to know what He wants us to do, and we have an ability to examine whether we're doing that or not. Then in our souls, we have the psychological part of us, we have our wills, and our mind, and our emotions. And then the body expresses all of that to the world. What we have seen, loved ones, is that it was God's will that we should receive the Holy Spirit and the life of the Holy Spirit from God through communion in our spirits. And that that life or relationship that we received would have the same effect on our lives as the effect of a fully satisfying love relationship. You know that many of us who have found ourselves in love have discovered that uh, we haven't such a tremendous need for food as we used to have. And we haven't such a tremendous need for a lot of other exciting things. In fact, many of our mums and dads are amazed that we're prepared just to sit with some girl or sit with some fella and just look at them. And we who wanted all the motorbikes and all the boats and the cars uh, to keep us happy. And we discover that when you are receiving satisfaction deep, deep down in your being, through the recognition and the acceptance of some other human being who knows you utterly, then you discover that you don't have need for a lot of the other substitutes that you have been using for years. Now, that was God's plan. That we would receive, through our relationship with him, all the satisfaction, all the emotional satisfaction and the intellectual satisfaction that we needed. And we would be utterly satisfied with our lot and our relationship with the Father. Then it was God's will that through the intuition of our spirits, he would intimate to us what he wanted us to do in the world. And we would in turn pass that through our conscience, which would, because of its close relationship with our wills, would then examine whether we were using our minds and emotions to express that will of God and the direction and power of God that we receive through intuition out through our bodies to the world. And that was the Father's plan for us. And that was his will. And in that way, of course, we would have been used by God to express his direction and power to his world. In that sense, we would presumably have been shown by him that we should take the garbage that we dump uh, on the outside borders of every city and we should use it to heat our cities. We would have received through God intimation and guidance that we should use our sewage and the tremendous tons of nitrogen in our sewage and we should make use of it to fertilize our crops. 
Presumably he would have shown us that we ought to use the wind and the solar energy in our world to produce the energy that we needed for in our industries. And of course also we would have realized that we should use this enjoyable life that we experience with God and use the precious 70 years that we ourselves have to transmit that power and direction of God to the rest of mankind. That was God's plan for our personalities. Now, what we have seen is we refused that absolutely. We refused this relationship with God. And we said to ourselves virtually, we can do without this Holy Spirit, whatever he is, this uncreated life of God. We can make do with the psychological life and the physical life that we have. And so, in fact, we simply refused this relationship with our Father in heaven. As a result, really, first of all, our whole spirits became sleepy and eventually died. And we're able to give no direction and no power to the rest of our personalities. But worse than that, we lacked the acceptance and the protection that we had before experienced from our Father. You know that protection. He says, look at the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they reap. And you never see a lily sweating. You never see a lily worried. You can't think of a flower getting worried or getting depressed. And that was God's will, of course, for us to have such a close relationship with him that we would experience not only his approval on our lives, but we would experience his protection. We lacked both of those. So what we in fact did, dear ones, was we began to use our mind to manipulate the world and other people so that we could get from them, through our minds, the recognition that we really needed from our Father. And so many of us, you know, are involved in not doing our jobs. We're not doing our jobs. We're trying to gain somebody's approval. We're not enjoying being an artist, or we're not enjoying being a teacher, many of us. We're not enjoying being salesmen. Many of us are just involved in getting other people's approval and recognition, because we really lack it from God himself. We began to use the world and people to begin to experience some of the protection that we lacked from our Father. And so we began to use the world to produce this protection for us. In reality, you can see what happened. The will ceased absolutely to be the executive of our psychological personalities. The will, rather, became the servant. He became, it became dominated by our minds and emotions, which were in turn dominated by the outside world and our fulfillment of our own needs. Far then from using our will and mind and emotions to express God's direction and power to the world, and to fill the world with his beauty and his life, we began to use our mind and emotions and our will to meet our own needs. We began to act on the expediency of our own needs of protection and approval rather than the principle of God's direction and power to the universe. So, loved ones, the, the will became a slave, actually, which wasn't God's plan at all. God's plan was that the will would be the executive. The will would determine what our minds thought. The will would determine what our feelings felt. The will would determine what our bodies did. But now our wills became utterly submerged. And instead of being the executive that was guided by the conscience that told us what God wanted us to do, the will became the manipulated servant and slave of our minds and emotions and of every expedient situation in which we find ourselves. So we didn't bother with which was the best way to heat the cities. We saw the coal and we took it out of the ground and we strafed the ground to get the coal. And we could make bigger profits that way and protect ourselves and provide for ourselves and gain ourselves some approval and recognition even in government circles and certainly in business circles. And so we went to it and we tore the coal out of the ground. We didn't bother about what was the best way to fertilize our crops. We decided the quickest way is to use the oil derivatives and the fossil fuel derivatives. And so we've used them until now we're beginning to come to the end of those sources of fertilizer. We didn't bother with the best way to get energy to empower our industries. We decided the oil is there, let's get it out of the ground. It doesn't matter who we take it from. 
It doesn't matter what mess we leave the third world in, we want it. And so we began, of course, just to suck everything into ourselves. And the whole personality became an interned, introverted experience and operation. Absolutely different from what God had intended. We decided, in fact, rather than go to the third world and share the life and the direction and power of God with them, we would empty the third world for what we needed. Now, that's part of what we mean, don't By saying that we are carnal. That's part of what uh, Paul means when he said in the, the verse that we're studying today, Romans 7 and 18a, if you look at it. Romans 7 and 18a. It's page 982. For I know that nothing good dwells within me. That is, in my flesh. Just take the word flesh first. Loved ones, he isn't saying nothing good dwells in my body. That misunderstanding has led to all the asceticism of the monasteries. And all the puritanical disrespect for our bodies. But he's saying, there is no good in me that is in my flesh. That is in my sarks, you remember. Ah, that doesn't make sense. S-A-R-X. Sarks is the Greek for flesh. And it means not just the body, but it means there is no good in my body-dominated life. There is no good in this carnal, independent life that I now live. There is no longer good in this body-dominated and physical-dominated will, using physical in the large sense of the mind and emotions. He's saying there is no good in that. In other words, sarks in the New Testament is not body, but it's body-dominated, physical-dominated, psychological-dominated personality. Of course, you know the level we've come to. We're always told in educational circles, what do you need? What will fulfill your personality? The thing has turned full circle. Because we're now encouraged to look for a job, not that will give the direction and power of God to the universe, but that will fulfill us. And so really, we have now institutionalized carnality and made it respectable. And that is what Paul is saying, there is no good in that part of me. So don't, you know, rebel against Paul and say, oh, there's no good in my body. Yeah, it's quite a good body. It does lots of good things. He's not saying your body. He's saying that physical, psychological, dominated personality. There's nothing good in that. You may say, nothing good? Oh, what do you mean, good? Well, loved ones, you'll find it in Luke 18 and 19. Luke 18 and 19. What the Bible means when it talks about good. Luke 18 and 19. It's page 912. And the ruler asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now that points to the truth that is found even in the etymology of the word good. In Anglo-Saxon, the word good is simply a long O as opposed to a short O in God. And it's very obvious that good in the roots of our language was tied to God. In other words, when you say a thing is good in Jesus' sense of the word or in the scriptural sense of the word, you mean it's good because it's according to God's will and it's done by his power and it's for his glory. Now that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying we're carnal people and there's nothing God directed and for God's glory and God empowered in our physical dominated and psychologically dominated personalities. That's really what he's saying. Of course, some of us say, oh, no, that's not right. I may not have allowed myself to be crucified with Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit, but my will does will many good things. And loved ones, Paul agrees with that. If you look at Romans 7, back to that verse we're studying, Romans 7 and 18b. I can will what is right. I think many of us are naive about this, you know. We think now this uh, 
personal power of evil, Satan, has got our personalities going the wrong way, he's going to make us all monsters. Well, he's not. He's no fool. He knows if we all became monsters, we'd know there was something wrong. So in actual fact, what he does is get his way as much as possible and make us treat ourselves as God who have to suck energy and suck approval and recognition from everybody else in the world. But from time to time, he allows this will to will what is right and what is good. And so obviously all of us feel a little like giving something to the United Fund from time to time. And we feel like doing many good things, you know that. Many more good things than that. So what Paul is saying is, you'll often find yourself willing what is good, but you're in the same position as you really always were in. That you can will what is right, but you cannot do it. In other words, you can will to do something good according to God's will, by God's power, and for God's glory. But loved ones, you cut off God there in your life. You cut him off here. It is impossible to do anything for God's glory unless it is through God's power flowing through you. And if you say to me, you mean, Pastor, moral goodness is not what we're aiming at? That's right, the ones. There are many morally good men. The Huxleys were morally good men. Russell was a, Bertrand Russell was a morally good man. There is much moral goodness in the world, but there is no true goodness in the sense of something done according to God's will, by God's power, for God's glory, unless it is done through a personality that is operating the right way. Do you see where God gets his glory? He gets his glory from the power of his life flowing through the communion of our spirits in the intuition and through our consciences and our wills and our minds and emotions and out into the world. Then God can say, I did that. They've started to use their sewage for fertilizing because of my life going through their personalities. In other words, it's possible for many of us to use the sewage for fertilizing and have nothing to do with God at all. In that case, it just brings glory to our own brilliance. But God's will is that his life would come through us like that. And loved ones, I think we need to be really aware that that moral goodness or that carnal goodness where you can will what is good, but you cannot do it. You can will a thing for God's glory, but you cannot bring it to God's glory unless it's done by the Spirit pouring through your personality. That whole uh, practice of carnal goodness started really in Genesis 3. And you might want to look back to it because it's so plainly there. Genesis 3 and 5. Many of us, you know, are foolish. We think that uh, Satan is all Rosemary's baby and that kind of stuff. But uh, he isn't at all. He likes to do lots of good things. As long as it's not by the power of God flowing through a personality. Because he knows what God is after is personalities that operate in his way that will be utterly at home with him. Satan knows that. Satan knows that it isn't the results that count. It's the personality. God is more concerned with what you and I are than with what we're bringing about in his world, really. If we are what he wants us to be, we'll bring about his will. But it's Genesis 3 and verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan right there was saying, look, you're going to be like God. You're going to be doing God's will. God made you in his image. He wants you to be like him. Now that's exactly what you're going to do. And so really, in a way, Adam and Eve were probably willing what they believed was God's will. And many of us find we can do that. We can will what is right, but to do it, requires the Holy Spirit of God pouring through our personalities in that way. Dear ones, you can see a lot of this carnal goodness if you look at it in some of Jesus' comments on the Pharisees. Matthew 12. Matthew 12 and 33 to 34. And there Jesus laid emphasis on the being rather than the doing because he saw more clearly than we do how you can often will the right thing, but you cannot do it because you are not basically a God-directed and God-empowered person. Matthew 12 and verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. 
So he's saying you're pretending to be good, but you know yourself your life is not dominated by the power of God's Spirit. Or look at Matthew 23, the ones, because the carnal will loves religion. I think a lot of us feel, you know, oh well, proof that I'm in the right position with the Holy Spirit is that I come to church every Sunday. Well really, the carnal will loves to do that. Uh, and Satan really enjoys a bit of religion. Uh, he knows it doesn't do anybody any harm. And usually does them a lot of good from C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters point of view. Matthew 23 and verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of extortion and rapacity. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and of the plate, that the outside also may be clean. And uh, Jesus is pointing out uh, they're on the outside loving religion. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. I think it's important to see that the carnal will loves philanthropy and loves supernatural activity, really. Matthew 7 and verse 22. Matthew 7 and 22. Now, a lot of us are led astray by this because we keep thinking, oh, well, if my will is willing what is good, then I must be okay. No, uh, the carnal will will often will what is good, but is not able to do it. Uh, 22, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Now why say that to them? If they were casting out demons in his name. Because Jesus knew they weren't doing it by his power, but by the supernatural power of the elemental spirits of the universe. And so it is possible often to will the right thing and even to appear to do the good thing. But loved ones, unless it is because your will is a slave of your conscience, it will never redound to God's glory. And that's the heart of it. You know. Is your will the unquestioned slave of your conscience? Or when you do good things, is it not so much because God's Holy Spirit has poured through your conscience and has told you to do them, as it is individual devisings of your mind and emotions to do something good deliberately on your own and by your own power? That's the issue. The issue is not really, are you doing lots of good things? I bet that all of you are doing many good things. You know, All of us, I'm sure, are involved in doing many good things. But the heart of it is, are you doing it because of obedience and slavery to your conscience, to unquestioning slavery to your conscience? Or is it because your will is dominated by your mind and emotions and they have determined that this is a circumspect or prudent thing to do at this time? And there's just a complete difference. One way, it's an interned thing to build yourself up and to provide yourself with the protection and the approval that you lack from God. The other way, it's a way of sharing the direction and power of God's life with the world. That explains partly why you've seen results from some good things that you've done and seen absolute defeat and absolute uh, failure in other good things that you've done. Because there is a difference to ones by the power. So really what I'd ask you is not to, do you come to church every Sunday. Not do you try to be kind to your neighbor. But is your will the unquestioning slave of your conscience? Or are there things that your conscience has told you you have received in the intuition of your spirit and you have broken that and you have broken that connection and no longer is your will the slave of your conscience. Your conscience tells you to do something and you discuss it with your mind and emotions to see if it's a circumspect and prudent thing to do. A loved ones, there is a way of freedom and it's really where your will is the absolute slave of your conscience. Would you be prepared to take a stand today and even determine that? That's what it means to be crucified with Christ. To stop having the right to let your will be guided by the outside and to commit yourself to your will being guided only by your conscience. In every little detail. And it just makes all the difference. Just pray. Dear Father, we know the light and life that will flow into our homes and into our job situations if we were to take this step. Father, we know that we help to bring the murkiness to the office. We help to bring the grayness to our colleagues' moral opinions. 
because we hold back so often ourselves, Lord. So often we've known that you were giving us through the intuition of our spirit's direction. We've known we should make a move. We've known we should let that spirit of spontaneity flow through from you to those with whom we work. And we've held back and questioned the thing in our minds and discussed as to whether it would be a prudent thing to do. And all the freshness and vitality and vibrancy of your Holy Spirit has drained from the original command. And it's ended up a disappointing, expedient action on our behalf. Father, we know you could transform our offices and you could transform our homes and you could transform our classes at school if we would take this step of putting our wills unquestioningly under the executive of our conscience. Father, I would trust you to deal with each of my brothers and sisters and deal with me and enable us to see that being crucified with Christ involves doing that and letting God take care of the consequences. So I trust you, Lord Jesus, to baptize with the Holy Spirit any brother or sister who is willing to take this step and to allow you to come in as the executive of their lives and not as their servant. For your glory. Amen.